What's going on, Midlothian? We're back here, the Cement City Chatter Podcast, always live from the Opoka Palace. A um, little bit of change up in my introduction today because John's had the hiccups for the last seven days. So to my right is the one and only Tim Wilkins. How are you today? Uh, disappointed that... Just hang on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because we are um, continuing our uh, candidate podcast where we've okay i'll get the i'll get the good yes you'll get the good you'll get the you'll get the good on the intro show. on okay. our regular show we, we do want to be serious here because we do have uh serious issues to deal with um and uh the the school board race is uh, important to the city and we want to make sure that like everybody understands that you know, it is a serious issue. We want to take it seriously. And so we'll screw around on the regular show. Yeah, Don't I'll worry. Show, I just, I, I need to let the people know that at, at times I do know how to be mature. So. It's true. We'll see it someday. In that regard, we're going to continue moving along. And um, uh, we've got uh, Mr. Ed Harrison with us tonight. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank I'm you glad, for having yeah, me thank on. Thank you time. for coming on. I appreciate on. it very much. Thank you for coming on. We've been very fortunate uh, this election season, Ed, where um, we've had every candidate, whether, um, the incumbent of that seat or whoever's running for that seat uh, on the show uh, for the city council and also for uh, for school board. Well, there's only one one there's contested only, yep, place yep, only one th this time around. Tammy Toby, uh, nobody wanted to run against her, I guess. And so she is the de facto electee uh, for place six. But so, uh, yeah, place seven has two candidates, Sherry Dawson and Ed Harrison. Uh, and we're pleased to have Ed here. Ed, so um, what do you want uh, people to know about you? Well, thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, my name is Ed Harrison. Uh, my wife and I have lived here in the Midlothian ISD for pushing 23 years now. Um, I am a business owner. I started my business in 1983 and I ran it until two years ago. This year would have been 40 years. I still mess with the business a little bit. I do some land buy and sell, but I was a, a custom home builder for nearly 40 years. And in that time, I built that business to be a pretty good sized home building company. And I was really, uh, really pleased to do that. It was an honor to get to employ so many people, create jobs and learn the business structure. And through that business, I got to serve on a lot of boards and commissions and such. And I know a lot about profit, nonprofit, governmental entities and so on and so forth because of our interaction within that business. So I told you about my wife and I being here for 23 years. We've also got three kids. And uh, my oldest is uh, Brian. He's 40 now, and he's a graduate of Texas A&M. You might have heard of that school. Yep. Yep. It's a little school down south. A little south. school down south. Might have heard of Brian. If you hadn't, you probably should have. <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast, you should probably know who Brian is. He's got a degree in economics, and he, is, uh, he lives right here in the MISD. And he has four kids. Uh, two of which attend MISD right now, and the third will be attending MISD next year. And we're very proud of Brian. We've also got two other daughters. My, uh, my oldest daughter, her name is Carrie. She also lives in MISD, and tonight, you said I could bring an entourage. I've got my oldest grandson here <coughs> with us tonight. He attends MISD and does his, uh, so does his other, his sister attends, uh, they attend, both, both of them attend McClatchy. He, he's quite the, he's quite the car fan. He, uh, we, we've been known to have a car or two around here, and uh, and first thing he did was go check them all out. So a Absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to train the boy upright. <laughs> I'm very proud of Carrie. She's a registered nurse, and she works labor and delivery over at Waxahachie Baylor. And then I've got a third child, uh, Kelly, and Kelly does not live in this area. She married a guy from New Jersey, and we have three grandkids with her, and they are up there in the New Jersey area. And he is buying a business from his dad, so I don't think that they're going to be moving back down here. I wish they would. I could have all 10 grandkids <laughs> I know maybe within, nice. within a couple miles, but we have seven within a couple miles. And so we enjoy our family. And uh, that's a little bit of background. Yeah, I understand your pride a little bit. I became a grandfather two years ago, believe it or not. You don't look like it. No, my oldest son. Um, actually, I share a grand. I share two granddaughters with Gary Vineyard, who's on the school board. Mm -hmm. uh, his daughter and my son, got married and had two daughters okay so the grandchildren are awesome yeah they are they are they they're are. way better than my kids yeah we love them we love having them around yes they're they're fun so um well ed this this may be, may seem like a self-answering question given your love of family and uh 
and, and history with the community, but why did you decide to run for city, I'm sorry, for school board? Yeah, I didn't run for, I, I didn't decide to run for city council. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> sorry. sorry about that. I've been that's doing a, that all season, so. <laughs> that's okay, that's fine. You know, we have been in this district, like I said, for 23 years, and one of the things that attracts people in Middle Lothian is the quality school district. Mm -hmm. We are known for having a quality yep, school district. agreed. And as a builder, uh, we sold a lot of homes in this area because of MISD. When I retired, well, actually, it was about a year before I retired, I began attending the school board meetings. So for pushing three years now, I've either been attending or watching online the school board meeting. And I wanted to see what was going on because I would hear things and I wanted to validate what I was hearing myself. And so I began to uh, attend those meetings and I noticed some things that caused me some concern. And if we don't arrest some of those, those issues right now, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, some of our test scores are either static or going down. Right now, MISD students across the board read at about 57% of grade level. Now, let's be honest, that's not as bad as it could be, but it's not as good as it should be. And I think we can do a lot better than that. I want to get our schools focused on uh, reading at grade level across the board. I want us to focus on math, science, history, and the things that prepare our students for the 21st century. Also, I'm very concerned about teachers, and, and teachers are something very near and dear to my heart. I hear a lot of people say, well, we need to give teachers more money, and I agree. And let me tell you, I think that we can increase teachers' salaries without increasing our taxes. Last year, we gave the teachers a pay increase, but then we turned around and increased the taxes also. So it's kind of you give them something in one hand, then you take it back with the other. Right. I don't think we have to do that. I've looked at the budget, I've gone over it, and I understand that we don't need to do that. But my background with teachers is one of the things that has compelled me to run for this seat. If we don't have quality teachers teaching our kids and they're not given the freedom to teach and they're not given the support in the classroom, both in discipline areas and other areas, then they're not going to be able to teach to teach as quality as they could. I want to go back just a little bit further. And I want to tell you a story I don't often tell, but because I'm running for school board, I'm going to tell this story. A long time ago, uh, I feel like saying a long time ago in a land far, far away, but that's not that far away. I was sitting in a classroom and a school counselor came and got me out of the classroom. He took me outside into the hallway and he said to me, Ed, we've looked at you. You're never going to graduate taking regular classes. So we're going to put you into metal trades, which back then was called vocational education. It's a good thing. Today they changed the name CTE mm -hmm. and they did put me into vocational education. One of the reasons I was having problems in school my dad died when I was 13 years old. Yeah. Mm. And when I was 15 or 16, I was on my own. I didn't have anybody to live with. Mm. I was working full time selling shoes. And back then in the old days, you guys won't remember this, back then in the old days, retail stores used to close at 6 p.m. So I would get out of school and I would go sell shoes until 6 p.m. and all day Saturday. And then there was an auto center where I would go do tune-ups on cars and do uh, tire, mount tires and balance tires. And I would do that till nine o'clock, then I would drive and I had a place by myself. Sometimes I had a roommate, sometimes I didn't. At 16 it, years old? At 16. Wow. Yeah, and so I would go to school because I, I desperately wanted to finish school. I never had any idea of quitting school, never. It didn't go through my mind. Long story short, the school found out that I didn't live with a parent or guardian. And before I get into that, I wanna tell you what, what teachers did for me though. There was a teacher named Mr. Harrow. Mr. Harrow was about four foot nothing. She was a very short woman, and I thought she was old at that time. Today, I would not think she's that old. Mr. Harrow was my history teacher, and I always loved history. From the time I was a boy, I've loved history. And uh, that's my undergraduate degree is in history. Mr. Harrow would get in my face, and she would tell me, Ed, you can do better than this, you can do better than this. She would challenge me, she would poke me in the chest, and then she would laugh with me and tell me a joke, and she was a great teacher. I had another teacher like that, Miss Cisco, in my English class. The school found out I wasn't living with a parent or guardian, and they expelled me. Wow. So after I was expelled, I remember that day going home, and I sat on my bed, and I had a little German shepherd dog, and I sat there on that end of that bed just petting that dog, wondering what I was going to do, because I didn't want to be a failure. I didn't want this to be the end of my life. I didn't, there's nothing wrong with working on cars. I still do it. I love cars. So after a few months, I decided that I had to do something, and I joined the Navy. Vietnam was going on, so they gladly took me, yeah. and uh, went through boot camp. I get asked a lot of questions, where'd you graduate from high school? 
I didn't graduate from high school. But while I was in the Navy, I became a, a CB, and I was a construction electrician. Construction battalion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we say the Marines blew it up, we built it. <laughs> we fixed it. And uh, during that time, I took a GED. I passed the GED, and I served my time in the Navy, and I came home to Maypearl, Texas. And in Maypearl, Texas, I was helping a farmer. I lived in a barn. I took care of his cows. And Hill Junior College, I had some friends. I started attending First Baptist Church in Maypearl, Texas, made some great friends. I became a Christian while I was in the Navy, which was unusual. Met these friends at church, and they said, Ed, you need to go to Hill Junior College with us because I wanted, I didn't want to be a failure. I wanted to prove that I could finish something. Wow. So they would come by in the Hill Junior College bus, and they would pick, us, pick me up, and I would ride to Hill Junior College. I could not say enough good things about the people at the college at that time. That was a long time ago. They took care of me. They helped guide me in the classes. They gave me some remedial training. They helped get my skills back up. Well, it took seven years. I finally graduated with a bachelor's degree from Dallas Baptist College, now Dallas Baptist University. During that time, I met my wife, we got married. We've been married for 45 years. And I wanna tell you one other caveat to this whole story. The counselor who took me out into the hallway and said, Ed, you will never finish school. That man's name was Gordon Wilson. Wow. Gordon was doing his job. Mm -hmm. He was going off statistics, grades, and my performance. And let me sure. tell you, I was no saint. But he was going off what he had to look at, the data. He took me out there. Gordon Wilson and his wife were best friends with a family that in town there, and their last name was Roman. And they had a daughter, and that daughter <laughs> graduated in the top 10% of her class. Well, I know where this is going now. <laughs> Gordon Wilson attended that daughter's marry, uh, wedding when that daughter married me, yeah. the guy that did not finish high school, <laughs> and we have been married 45 years. Mr. Harrell, Miss Cisco, the teachers at Hill Junior College, made all the difference in the world to me. My professors at Dallas Baptist College, and not only that, I earned a bachelor's degree. I went on and earned a master's degree. And one time I took a guy who worked for me and I asked him, Eric, would you please find me the statistics on the number of kids who don't finish high school that go on and get a bachelor's degree? And he came back, this is before the internet, he came back and he said, Ed, I think it's one-tenth of one percent. Right. And I said, would you find for me the statistics of kids who get a master's degree? Oh, man. Mm. He came back a couple weeks later, and he said, I can find no statistics. So teachers can either instill in that child mm -hmm. a desire to succeed. They can prod that child to love history or to love English or to love writing, or they can just quench them. And when the administration weighs heavily on teachers, and I'm not saying ours does, but it weighs heavily on teachers where teachers can't teach, to the grade level and the way that that child needs to be taught, then that's not a justice to the teacher and it's injustice to the child. No, that's, that's a remarkable story. Sounds like, I mean, you succeeded kind of in, despite or in spite of, you know, them saying that you, you would not succeed in, in that manner. So you had your positive influences and you had influences that were counterproductive that you proved wrong. So, so at any idea. point, did, did you just tell your father-in-law, well, I showed you. My father, <laughs> oh, no, Gordon Wilson wasn't my father-in-law. Oh. He was best friends with my father-in-law oh, gotcha. and okay. my mother-in-law. Right. Yeah. Right. He attended the wedding. Oh, very good, very good. Very cool, very cool. So um, <clears throat> moving along to here we are uh, running for school board. Was there any strategy in the place that you picked or? Yeah, absolutely. It, it was an open seat. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I did think about running in the years prior, but I did not run because it wasn't the right time. And I can tell you who tells me it's the right time. It's my bride. Yeah. And if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. No, I understand so that. She is my right arm and my, my, my faithful wife, and I'm going to listen to her. You know, so um, we've got bonds in this election. Um, I've heard about that. That are coming out. <laughs> and, and we were fortunate enough on this show to have Tammy uh, a few episodes ago. I don't know if you saw it. She came, came, came on the show and, and talked about the bonds and explained them. Um, uh, I've got my own personal opinion on the bonds. I've got my own personal opinion on um, how I would like to see the city progress and the stature of it and keeping it wholesome and, and desirable, okay? I mean, the same reason you built homes for all those people for all those decades that wanted to live here because of the schools, 
Um, I share that same opinion. So when it comes to um, these bonds, I mean, where do you lie on that? You think it's... That's a fair question. Thank you for that. Let me ask you a question before I answer. Because I think you need to fund the schools. That's my opinion. And Got I'll it. Just, I want to say mine before, but... Got it. Let me ask you a question. Can either of you tell me how much total indebtedness MISD has right now? $285 million. You want to take a guess, Rob? No. You don't? I, 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 shoot I mean, out there I, I grab a number. In debt? Yeah. I'm, I'm not qualified because I don't understand. I mean, I understand how the bond process works, and I know it's a debt at the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I wouldn't know. I'm well, probably in the fours. Well, you're getting close. Both of you are not that far off. But right now, as of August of last year, in a school board meeting where they were setting the tax rates for this year, they announced that this, the, the total indebtedness right now, the principal balance is $500 million, and then there's $100 million in accrued interest. So if you take those two numbers, and it's a little bit higher than that. Now, now the district may have paid it down a few bucks, but give or take $600 million. Okay. And if you add to that the total bond indebtedness that we could accrue, that'd be another 400 plus million dollars right for like 440 or 430 or whatever I think it's 415 yeah, something but, like but whatever it is and so if you take 400 and 600 that's one billion dollars now in the last board meeting uh, when they uh, voted to bring this out and allow the voters to decide on this which is proper uh, Jessica Ward pointed out that the debt service on this debt will be 40 million dollars a year so let me let me back off and say this to begin with I am not anti-bond. I want everybody to understand it. We have a critical growth problem in the MISD. We have a growth problem most especially in the elementary school area. We need an elementary school. I wish that they had done the bond proposal different. I wish that they had said, uh, we need an elementary school with this capacity on that corner and here's the cost. The cost will be 30 million, yeah. 40 million, 50 million. Now, let me talk about this for just a minute. Before I started my own business, I sold construction cranes a long time ago, in the 80s. Construction cranes that were millions of dollars and other very high dollar equipment. We worked on buildings downtown Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, other areas. There was no contractor that I ever talked to that did not have a budget. And when I presented my equipment for their job, it had to fit within the budget that was outlined. Understood. Today, we are talking about a bond program that does not have a definitive budget, doesn't even have definitive plans. The plans haven't been drawn, but we're being told that X amount of dollars are going to build these schools, but we don't have a budget, we don't have a plan. Now, I've just got to tell you, in my 40 years in the construction industry, not counting my time in the heavy equipment industry, I've never seen that. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's kind of backing into the situation. They should have said, that corner, this plan, $40 million or that corner, this plan, $50 million. We've got to get behind housing our students, making sure that we're not overwhelmed with the growth that's coming, but I'm not sure that we're doing it in the right and most economically feasible, uh, the best economic way. Let me explain this. Where do these figures come from? What figures? In, in, in the bonds, A, B, and C, do you know? I mean, do they just say, okay, Okay, bond A, four hundred and something million dollars. It's for a couple elementary schools and some other stuff. Yeah, bond. Well, the district put together the bonds. Yeah, and they made the proposal. I mean, I, I brought it with me because I don't. They, they figure this out part. how much it'll cost uh, theoretically to build a particular building and then ask for that much money. Okay. Well, actually, what they do is they they have a hypothetical on it because they can't tell you what it's going to cost to build because they don't have plans. And they need the plans in order to get specific prices. Well, now when you say they don't have plans, like they already have the floor plans, they already have you know, the layout of the buildings. Yeah, but they don't have the architectural. In the last meeting, I was sitting next to the architect mm -hmm. who is going to be designing some of this stuff. And, it, and they have a theory, they have a rendering, they have a concept, mm -hmm. but they don't have the plans. And that's a big difference. Okay, so uh, I was under the impression that Midlothian had standardized school plans. Is that not true? Not that I'm aware of. Hmm. Now, okay. if it, Tim, you may be aware of something that I'm not, but I, I don't think so. But if you're looking at our 13 campuses right now, I don't see much standardized. Do hmm. you? But yeah, actually, three of the schools are sister schools. Are they? Okay. Yeah. Well, then I'm wrong on that. Thank you for correcting me. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I may be wrong. I'm, you know, I was just under the impression that 
you know, we were going to build essentially the same floor plans uh, effectively. Now, they, they apparently build small differences into the schools, but they're, they're all sister schools. Mm -hmm. Makes it easy for... Well, if they had the, even if they had the same floor plan, depending on what market school A with the same floor plan as this was built, you've got to take in cost lumber. I mean, COVID did a, a huge number on the lumber market. Well, everything has changed. Everything yeah. has changed. And by the time we get to this, it, it's probably going to be more or less. But let me talk about this, this, this bond issue. Our growth has slowed down. What happens if the growth does slow down more and we incur this debt and we're on the backside of that bell curve a little bit? We could be forcing a tax rate on taxpayers. Right now, as I knock on doors, and I've knocked on hundreds of doors asking for votes, what happens if our tax rate goes up where the very people we're trying to attack, attract to MISD can't afford to live here because of our high taxes? Do you think it, that the growth slowed down? I think that our sales have slowed down. As a matter of fact, when you see some builders offering incentives, builders offering incentives, they don't do it when the market is hot. Right. I mean, I just wondered, coming off, you know, uh, the, the big topic about this mud district and 8,500 homes that they're proposing to build mm -hmm. in the Highview Ranch property. Um, but I want to go back to something else that we, we haven't discussed, and that's how do we, anything that we do, whether it's build an elementary school, whether it's a, a, a cookie cutter plan, Tim, like you're referring to, and those are my words, or whether it's a custom plan that fits that lot. And usually topography type of soils underneath, those are going to affect, even if it's a standardized plan, those are going to have huge effects on yeah. the cost. Um, how do we increase the test scores? How do we do better for our students? So the first thing, if I'm elected, if I have the honor of serving on the school board, if I'm elected, the first thing I want to do on every issue is say, how does this raise our test scores? How do our kids excel? And how do we make our kids safer in the school, where they feel comfortable using the bathrooms, where they feel comfortable around their peers, where they feel safe. How do we increase the pay of teachers? How do we support the teachers in the classroom? And how do we not take back the pay through future tax increases? So I, I, I'm telling you, the bond is a loaded issue, but I wanna go back on every one of them and say, how does this increase the quality of the education within the school district? Let me also say, you know, when you run for school board, that takes a unique personality, I think, because as we were joking, I think, before the show, you don't make any money off this. Right. And I got to tell you, I don't need a resume enhancement. I'm not looking for a future vocation. I don't receive any money from the MISD. Uh, my company doesn't receive any money from the MISD. I'm doing this for my grandkids and all the students. I want to make sure that MISD is not focused on politically correct agendas. I want to make sure they're focused on education. I don't want to wastefully use our taxpayer money. And I want to make sure that our kids do the best they can do. No, I understand that. And I, I, as a taxpayer, I don't want to, you know, so spend my tax dollars I, on just random stuff. Sure, but I also like, feel uh, like is, I feel like that we need it at some point. Is, um, is there is there uh, instances that you've observed where we're spending money on um, things that aren't? Uh, you know, tr your your goals are. I think I think everybody would would agree that you have great goals. Um, you know, some people might differ with how to get there. So, is are there instances that you uh, have witnessed to where the school the school is specifically is doing something that you would like to do differently? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Tim. For num number one, I think I'm the only person in this race who has, can read a balance sheet. I'm the only person in this race who has dealt with bankers, lawyers, CPAs, et cetera, on a regular basis. I'm the only person in this race that has ever had to work with government entities to get issues through, and that's government entities in Washington, D.C., government entities in Austin, government entities in, our, our, um, in, the, uh, in the county, mm -hmm. and city government entities. So when, I, have a, I have a wild out of the left question oh no. for you real quick. Okay, go were, ahead. Were you previously a mayor? No. Okay, all right. So uh, I've had a few people tell me that you were formerly a mayor, and I, I couldn't find any evidence of that, but I thought I would just ask. Well, if so. I was, I'm unaware of it. <laughs> okay, I slept very through good. That all right, well, no. then I apologize for interrupting. <laughs> That's okay. And forgive me, I'm... I'm not an expert on any of this. These questions I'm asking are just because I don't know the answer. That so, is okay. That's um, fine. That, and and that's I think a lot of our listeners 
are in the same boat. You know, I don't think a, I don't think a, a, just the majority of everybody understands even what a bond is or, or you know, that it's a debt. Even, it's a debt. You know, and so forth. So, well, let me go back to Tim. I think your question was specific areas. Right now, there is a private association mm-hmm. that we are funding through taxpayer dollars. Mm-hmm. And let me give you an example of this. I'm a member of the Texas Association of Home Builders. I've served on their board of directors. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the National Association of Home Builders. I've served on their board of directors. I'm a member of the Dallas Builders Association, the fourth largest association, or used to be, Mm -hmm. in the United States of America. I I not only serve on their board of directors as a life director, I was past president of that organization. Every year, I take my checkbook and I pay out of my money Mm -hmm. uh, to be a member of that association. Okay. But what we do as taxpayers of the MISD, the MISD collects our tax money and then pays a private association that is not part of the state of Texas. I don't think that that's right. I think that if the administration or the teachers want to be a member of that association, they should take the money out of their pocket and join that association. What is now, that let association? Now, let me tell you, that's TASB, Texas Association of School Boards. Okay. Now, let me go on one step further with that. I think the bill last year was $250,000, give or take. I'm off, maybe a little bit, but it was around $250,000. In setting the board meetings, mm-hmm. there are times where they have expenses come up. I'm thinking, where was this in the budget? Why wasn't this planned for? And they take money out of this pot and put it in that pot. So I think that because of my business background, like one of the first votes you'll take if I get elected, first votes I'll take when I get elected, it Mm -hmm. will be the budget. Mm -hmm. You step in, you look at this budget. I want to know what all is in that budget. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to ask for answers about privately funded association, dues. What do the dues do for the taxpayers? But most of all, what do these privately funded associations, what do these dues do for our students? Will they be better off or not as good if we don't fund them or do fund them? Mm -hmm. Those are the questions we have to ask. And right now, those questions are not being asked. Wow. Okay. And let me me talk one more about the budget. Mm -hmm. How does the budget affect the students? If you were in the August meeting last year, August 22, that was when they set the tax rate. I'm sitting in the meeting with other citizens watching this tax rate get set. Mm -hmm. The staff came in and they did their job and they do a good job. We, I think overall we have a good staff. State law says that if you raise the tax rate above a certain level, that it has to be a referendum, has to be put to the taxpayers. Do you approve this tax rate? Right. Well, the tax rate was all but at that level. Mm -hmm. So they raised it as far as they could to near that level and then stayed under that level so that the taxpayer didn't get a chance to vote on that tax rate. Mm -hmm. Well, because some of our tax, because some of our school board members caught that, they lowered the tax rate, but our tax uh, our, the evaluation of our properties have gone up so much that it was still a net increase in taxes. That's why I say we gave the teachers a raise, but we took part of it back with a tax increase. So the point I'm making with this is, to a degree, mm-hmm. the way that governments look at things is they go up to the level, here's what we can spend, mm-hmm. so we're going to build our budget on that. That's different than the business or even a homeowner does, a family. Sure. They build their budget on what the income is, and a family who's got mm-hmm. Janie and Johnny in the school can't say, well, we're just going to demand that we, our, our, our employer give us more money. Sure, sure. But that's essentially what tax identities do. Right. So given that I, we'd probably agree that in Midlothian, most of the people living here are homeowners, um, and most of them have the homestead exemption on their home. Okay, and maybe it's not most, but it's it's some large portion of, of the city. And so of those people, uh, the value of their home is limited to a 10% increase taxable value every year. Um, so given that 10% increase, in order to keep the same, uh, you know, and that's market driven. Like you would agree that, that people's houses are worth more every year due to demand in this area and that's all of DFW right now because people are moving out of places like California and moving here, um, but also specifically demand in Midlothian because we're geographically desirable, we have a beautiful town, that sort of thing. So given that the value of people's homes in this day and age are almost guaranteed to go up 10% a year, 
I mean, are you advocating that we lower the school tax 10% every year to make up for that? No, Because otherwise not. we're going to have increased taxes every year. No, I'm not advocating anything right now, Tim. What I'm mm -hmm. saying is that right now we have a very high tax rate and our families are suffering. And think about it like this. Well, now, do we, do have, do we have high taxes or a high tax rate? Because we, the rate... We have high taxes. Thank okay. you for the correction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When the price of the property keeps going up, mm -hmm. and by the way, Zillow, I was looking at Zillow the other day, they're forecasting some properties going down. And so that's going to decrease taxes. Mm -hmm. now, on the other side, to a taxing entity, when property values go down, they raise tax rates. Sure. Yeah. Because they want the money. Well, right, right. And what, what I'm saying is, regardless of whether property values go up, we've got to stop and say, how is this money being utilized? And because it's a taxing entity, it does not give them full reign or uh, authority to say, we just got to have this money without any accountability. So what I want to ask is the same thing we do in any business, mm -hmm. any private association. I've, I've served on boards and commissions. I was uh, served on the Texas Task Force on Affordable Housing in Austin for a year. I was elected chairman of that. One of the things that we had to do was ask about funding. How are things funded? How are we going to cut the funding? Mm -hmm. uh, I've served on national board, I've already mentioned. I serve on Charlton Advisory, Charlton Hosp Methodist Hospital Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. We're always talking about money. How do we save money? How do we cut sure. back on, on uh, expenditures. Mm -hmm. And the question comes down to, how can we cut back? I, I was talking to an employee of MISD the other day. I'm not going to tell you what department. Sure. Uh, they're one of my supporters. Mm -hmm. And they said, there is, they're not a teacher. They're not in the administration. Okay. They said, Ed, you would not believe the waste that goes on. Yeah, I, I do believe the waste that goes on. I cannot pinpoint it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, the kids and the teachers have got to be taken care of. Did you know right now, our school system's budget, I think it's about $118 million a year. We are one of the biggest companies in Midlothian, if not the biggest. Oh, we're the largest employer, I in, can in tell you that. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's easily believable. I mean, yeah. No, I mean, that, that's, it's a, a fact. fact. Yeah. yeah. $118 million a year M industry. Most ISDs, no matter where they are, most ISDs are the largest employer in their, right. their, in yeah. their city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, we, and overall, I think Midlothian's a good school district. But here's my point. We've got to have people that understand business issues, that understand how do we correlate saving money with also producing a, 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 a student who's got a quality education. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, where I'm willing to spend more money mm -hmm. is for teachers. Mm -hmm. We are losing, I don't know if you're aware of this, we're losing some of our longest serving teachers, people who have been here 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. I knocked on the door of a, wound up being a teacher. I did not know she was a teacher. Mm -hmm. I actually met the husband. He said, you don't need to talk to me. And he went and brought his wife, and we talked, had a great conversation. She's been here for a long time, nearly three decades. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm quitting. Mm -hmm. Really? I said, why are you quitting? And she said, uh, I, I, I love, she almost teared up. She said, I love teaching. I love the students. Mm -hmm. I love being in the classroom. I can't take everything else. And as I talked to her, she Did said. Did she expand on she what said, that meant? She said that the discipline is a problem. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Now, I think overall we have a good school district. I keep saying that. But if we don't arrest some of these things right now and we don't spend more money on taking care of teachers, meeting their needs in the classroom, and paying them more, right now that $118 million, according to TEA, only 19% of that goes toward teacher salaries. Yeah, I don't want to jump ship, but in yeah, regards one, one to that thing, teacher. 19% plus 3% goes wow. toward benefits. So 22%, that's all. Do you think that this new system or hybrid system that you know there was the do we go four days that was a big thing a few what, a few weeks ago it was the on midlothian right talk four days four, four day, day five, five day, day hybrid yeah so i've got uh you know my my sister and brother-in-law they're lifelong educators they'll retire in the next probably five years they're in waxahachie now my sister's the counselor one of the counselors in waxahachie high school and brother-in-law in waxahachie as well and you know they made the comment that um, if we didn't, this was before the whole system was created, the hybrid, what are they calling it, a hybrid schedule? Well, so they started by suggesting or proposing a four-day schedule. Right, that as, the, as more districts go to that four-day schedule, you're going to find teachers finding jobs in districts that do that. That's the allegation. Is the that, that, that's that's is the stated possibly reason the allegation. For, for the suggestion behind it is is teacher retention and recruitment. That's you know not my not my, not my assertion, but that's you know the people that put it forward. The administration uh, put it forward saying this will help us retain teachers and help us recruit teachers. And there was a lot of pushback 
um, from the people who, uh, I think the loudest or most vocal uh, opponents of the four-day uh, schedule are, I'll just call them working parents. Um, you know, one or both, uh, basically all the caretakers in the home, whether it's one or two or whatever, they work five days a week and they count on five days of school to care for the kids. Uh, so that pushback happened uh, pretty, pretty the, the, strongly. The survey was yeah. un, was crazy unanimous. Of no, the I, people. I mean it was it was it was. Uh, I mean it was unanimous, man, it but wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't yesterday, it but was, it was sixty forty. Which oh, was it on a sixty forty? Um, you know, you do have fifty percent more people voting on the sixty than you do the okay, forty. Okay, so unanimous wasn't the right word. But, but Overwhelming it, it was, was strong to one yeah. direction. Sure, right, but then. Again, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a majority of people, but there was a vocal uh, number of people that pushed back. And so in response, I guess they came up with this hybrid schedule and that was, you know, it showed up kind of, I don't know, I felt like it was last minute and then, then approved by the board. Yeah, so what do you, what's your take on that? I, I mean... Actually, I was enjoying listening to you two talk. <laughs> Yeah, I was in the board meeting where that was approved. So let's go back and look at some history on this. If a business suggests a new product and they poll their customers on a new product, mm -hmm. they've got the product in mind. They've developed the product pretty much. I have been, years ago, I was asked to come and review, uh, uh, preview mm -hmm. a new pickup truck. I think it was a new Chevrolet pickup truck. And they paid me for something I enjoyed doing. I was shocked. And then they said, what do you think of this? And they asked me a bunch of questions. But the product was there. What, this is a business issue to me. Before you took a survey of the parents and the teachers, you should have had the product on the shelf. So what happened is the survey went out and they got the results of the survey. I'm not sure whether they were shocked, surprised, or in panic. I don't know what it was. But between the time of the revealing of the results of the survey and the introduction of the program or the agenda that we have for the coming year, the schedule for the coming year, was about one month. Mm -hmm. During that time, three MISD trustees were on the committee that helped develop this. And four of the trustees did not see this until a few days before when they got their board package. Mm. So what's amazing to me is you took a huge leap. In 30 days, you built this Hybrid, Rob, if you want to use that. I don't know what the term they're using. I, yeah, I, don't, but, I think they're calling it hybrid, but yeah. Yeah, they, 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 the hybrid schedule. And they brought that out, and four trustees who had seen it just in the few days before listened to the presentation, which lasted for, for about 39 minutes. Dr. Wilson, I believe it was, gave the presentation. And then they voted to do that, um, to implement that new uh, schedule for, for the next year. Well, it was voted six to one because Gary Vineyard said, he had problems about some kids who were receiving food through the school district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right now our poverty rate has jumped from 18 to 28%. Not many people talk about that. So that needs to be factored in. I talked to Gary after the meeting. I said, tell me what your thinking was on this. That was his main objective. How do we handle that? How do we handle that? I don't think that the teachers were properly polled, properly listened to, because there were quite a few teachers at that meeting. Once again, Teachers are an incredible, irreplaceable asset, especially those teachers who have maturity and have been there for a long time. Oh. I had a law enforcement official call me when this first started hitting the ground. He says, hey, Ed, if they go to this four-day work week, juvenile, I mean, four-day school week, juvenile crime is going to go up on the day they're not in school. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, have you ever noticed how juvenile crime goes up in the summertime? And I, he said, the kids are not being cared for by families who work. Both parents work. Also, I talked to another person who was involved with the survey done in another school district. This one's gonna shock you. They not only surveyed the parents and the teachers, they surveyed the high school students. The high school students did not want it because, or the, let, me, let me change that. The high school students with younger siblings did not want it because they were gonna be required to take care of their younger siblings because both <laughs> parents worked. They didn't want it. They wanted to be in school all five days. Yeah. Well, I, I can That's tell you, my, my, both of my high schoolers did want it because they just want a day less of school. That's why we don't ask them what they want. <laughs> well, they just have different reasoning. I, and that was my that was my you know question on if you isn't there state requirements of how many days a kid needs to be in school? 
So if you take a day out of the week, don't you just extend, I guess? It, the, it's broken It's broken down to the minute. Yeah, minutes. That's right. We did talk about yeah. that, down to the minute. So if you took a day out of the week, your summer would just be shortened, I would assume. Because you still have to. It, would that have been the case? I know it's it's neither here nor there. I haven't looked at, I've I've glanced at the the hybrid schedule. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't I know they took out uh, what how many? It, it, it basically it, it is effectively every third Friday off, um, and then they just kind of like shuffle some stuff around to fit the actual calendar, like holidays right. and things like that. So, well, I, I mean, I can't say I have strong feelings about any of the three. Five day, four day, or hybrid. You know, it's really, it's really interesting to hear people the, talk about it, but I don't have strong feelings because my teenagers. If we move to a four day, I don't need care for them. Um, if we keep it at five day, well, it just is what it is. And if we move to the hybrid, I mean, that's the one I like the least because it's the most confusing, and I would actually have to put the stuff in the calendar because. I wouldn't be able to remember when they're off. I want to go back to this planning issue, though. Sure. Before the survey was sent out, you should have had it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. I agree. And that's where I think that's, that's a management issue. That's a, a, an issue that needs to be changed. I think the school board should have oversight of that. Also, I, did, did they not I, already I, I have got, a schedule? I just got to tell you, I, I think that it's wrong mm -hmm. to give a school board trustee a couple days to look at this and then to ask them to vote on it. Yeah. I think it should be. Okay. And, and let me say something else about this. When the, when the trustee, the trustee is charged with the oversight, the budget, uh, overseeing the superintendent, et cetera. But when they're making big decisions and the school board administration comes up and gives a presentation that is at length 30, 40 minutes or longer, and they're usually top flight quality presentations, then I think a school board member should be able to say, um, thank you very much for that. It was a quality presentation. We appreciate the research that you gave us. Now, could you bring us someone else with the equal credentials of what you have and the equal research that comes out on a contrarian view. Because it, when, when the trustees, they're all busy, they're all working, and by the way, they're all good people. I like every one of them. But when they're given one side on a major issue, whether it's the budget, whether it's the tax rate, whatever it is, if you'll ever notice, watch these school board meetings, they're never given equal time to hear the contrary view from somebody that has an equal stature. Whether you agree with the contrary view or the positive view, that's irrelevant. But both sides need to have equal time and be heard. So when what, I, when, before you do that, Rob, when I ran my business meetings, I would gather everybody in, we would go over everything in the company. And I would say, okay, here's where I think we're going. This is plan A, B, C, this is where we're going. Tell me what's wrong with it. Find fault in my problem, in my plan. And if my superintendent, the general manager of construction would say, this is where we're going, we would ask the salesperson, the receptionist, everybody around, what do we find fault with that? How do we make that uh, make it better? Right. So what do you think right now is the single largest risk that we face with Midlothian Independent School District I, that just could affect that young man right there in the future if we do not get a hold of right now? I think we've got to go back to uh, strong teachers who are comfortable teaching that they're backed up, they're supporting their classroom environment. I think we've got to go back to teaching basic things. We've got to get our reading scores up. I've talked to education, educators who have said if the kid's not reading by the third grade, they're, difficult, they're gonna have difficulty all the way through. It doesn't yeah. matter whether it's algebra, history, nuclear fission, whatever it is, if they can't read by the third grade. Yeah. So we've got to make reading an emphasis. If you look at our test scores, they're static or declining. And we're not as bad as we could be, but we're not as good as we should be. So I teachers agree. and students. I agree. Well, is it, uh, before we wrap up, we're getting close to the hour mark. Anything you want to address and maybe bring up that we have? And haven't, we're here we for you. Because we we're give here you for this, you. This, this is your open show. Open mic. Yes. To just kind of wrap it up and let us know what we've missed and, and what you want people to know. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. By the way, I appreciate it very much. I want. Uh, I want to tell you, I'm the only person in this race who has a business background. I'm the only person who's balanced a budget. I'm the only person who can read a balance sheet. And I'm the most conservative candidate in this race. It's not just me saying that. This is a local school board race, but I was endorsed by the Young Republicans of Ellis County and an unprecedented move. I'm endorsed by the Ellis County Republican Party. And just this week, the, even the Texas Republican Party endorsed me in the school board race. 
I have the experience. I'm not looking to, for a future job from this. As I said to Rob, I'm not looking for resume enhancement. Right. I'm looking to do the best for our students and to keep our taxes low and to raise our scores. And I'd be honored to have your vote. I'd be honored to serve on your school board for the benefit of all of us. Well, Ed, I, I sure appreciate you coming on and, you know, give us the opportunity to meet you and just talk, you know, with the people of Midlothian. Um, love Thank to you. have you back sometime and, uh, you know, maybe get Brian on here. I want This is your show, so I didn't want to, you know, talk about... Uh, We're not talking about Brian when I'm on this show. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. He gets enough air time. I know he does. But anyways, it's an honor to have you on here. I really appreciate you. Midlothian, uh, get out there and vote. May 6th yeah. is early ele voting starts is April election 24th. day. April 24th is election day is early voting. Can I give my website? Absolutely. Harrison for Harrison for Midlothian ISD dot com. Harrison for Midlothian ISD dot com. And you also have a Facebook page. Too, I do. So I do. If you got questions for uh, Ed Harrison, Facebook, send them an email on the website. And like uh, most everybody is very accessible and easy to find so uh midlothian we love you we're out and go vote that's the main thing go vote regardless vote informed of, vote informed i just want <laughs> you to vote anyways see you guys later bye we're out